Let's begin with prayer. Lord, I do ask for your presence, Lord. If you don't go up before us, Lord, we don't want to go. You are the vine, we are the branches. Apart from you, we can do nothing, Lord. Lord, I ask for your anointing. I ask for your presence. I ask for the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher. I ask for the Holy Spirit to open up the eyes of our understanding, to open up the ears of our understanding. Lord, I have, I have many things to say today, and, and I know I don't have that much time to say amen, Lord. So I pray that you order my steps and that you order my words in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Brother Dave, is that, is that CD rolling there? Okay, great. You know, I think it was about three weeks ago, we had uh, Brother Kelly break. That message was that Kelly brought forth three weeks ago. I'm going to tag team it a little bit. Because number, number one, when he started preaching, actually the first 10 or 15 minutes, I'm saying he, he stole my thunder. Because he, he actually, the first 15 minutes of his message was like what I was preparing for today. And I was like, okay, Lord, I guess I'll preach something else. But uh, actually what Kelly brought forth that week was one of the best messages I have heard in a long time. And he delivered it better than I would have. I would, that was like, wow. Having said all that, why don't you turn open, turn your, open your Bibles to Matthew 24, 37. You all know this scripture. And, and Kelly was, was, was speaking on this a little bit several weeks back. And like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build upon what he said. And I want to put this right up front as we get into the word. The things that I'm going to say today, today to you, they're not meant to scare you. It's not about fear mongering. Many people are getting fearful in these days in which we live. But you know, we don't have to fear the storm. Brothers and sisters, there is a storm coming on America like we've never seen before. And America has seen storms. The revolution was a storm. The Civil War was a storm. World War I was a storm. World War II was a storm. You know the scripture, but let's pick up there. In Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Interesting that they didn't know. I mean, Noah had been preaching for 120 years. I mean, every, 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 every swing of the hammer, Noah was preaching. The guy's building an ark in the middle of the desert. No, what are you doing? A flood's coming. A storm's coming. No, you've been saying that for 90 years. A storm's coming. A flood's coming. No, you've been saying that for 100 years. You're a fool. How could they not know? Because having eyes, they could not see. Having ears, they could not hear. There's a storm coming. But we don't have to fear the storm. We should not be as the people of God. Brothers and sisters, do not be paralyzed by fear before the storm. But prepare in faith before the storm. Amen? We're living in incredible times, aren't we? I mean, we are, we are witnessing. We are witnessing the unfolding of events that have long been prophesied to take place before the coming of Jesus Christ. But as the day approaches, as I said, it seems like we've been talking about this stuff, but many are becoming fearful. We, we, we knew that it was coming. We've been eager to see it come. At least I've been eager to see it come. Maybe some haven't, but I, I've been eager to see it come. Because that means that Jesus, Jesus is coming. He's going to keep his promise. And yet many are becoming fearful. And instead of preparing, they're fretting. We've been talking about these things, Brother Tom, for so long. We've been, we've been talking about these, these, the, the Word of God. We've been talking about the prophecies. We've been speaking of them. And now that they're becoming less and less of an abstract theory and more of a reality, 
Many are becoming alarmed. Have you seen it in, 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 in people that you know that, that are Christians? They're getting scared. I've, I've seen it all over. I hear people saying they're, they're, they're afraid of what's coming on. We're, we, we, are, we are transitioning from the theoretical to the actual. And it's blowing us away. I mean, even Marsha sometimes, I'll, I'll walk around the house saying, man, I can't believe this is going on. I can't believe this is happening. And she'll say to me, why not? You've been preaching it for 40 years. <laughs> Roughly. I know, I know, I know I've been saying it, but it's really happening. <laughs> and in the natural, you can get fearful. Hey, we're human. Hey, listen, I'd rather be able to sit in my backyard and blast my stereo and put up the barbecue without having any fear of seeing a mushroom cloud in the distance? Hello? We always knew, in theory, that one day Christians would be persecuted. We always knew that they'd be hated, demonized, and marginalized to the point of insignificance. But all of a sudden we're saying, wait a minute, this is getting scary. I hear Christians all the time. You, 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 you begin to talk to them about what's going on in the world. You, talk, you begin to talk about, about, to them about how, how the Christian church in the Mideast, in Syria, in Iraq, a church that's been there for thousands of years, has been all, all but eradicated in the last two years because of ISIS, because of the rising Islamic caliphate. And I can get into all of that today, but I can't, I can't go down that bunny trail right now. But my point is this. Right now, as I speak worldwide, and particularly in the Mideast, 24-7, every 15 minutes, a Christian is being persecuted or murdered or executed or crucified or, 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 or captured and brought into, into enslavement to be sex slaves. I know we want to turn away from seeing that stuff, but that's what's going on right now in the church to your brothers and sisters. Forget about the denomination. Someone can call themselves anything they want. If they're dying for the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I will not, I will not denounce Jesus Christ. Do you think God cares about their denomination? That mentality is only in the American church. I'm sick of it. There is one body. There is one faith. There is one Lord Jesus Christ. And when one part of the body hurts, the whole body is affected and hurts. And too many American Christians think that won't happen here. Too many American Christians think that cannot happen here. We bought into a lie. But I know the God of this Bible. And the God of this Bible has judged every nation that's ever existed throughout all history when they've abandoned him. And when they've, when they've committed abominations before him. And who do we think we are that we will escape any of that at all? It's coming. It's already here. It's already at the door. We always knew that in the last days, evil would abound more and more and would almost seem to be winning. We always knew that in the, day, that, that in the last days, the days would get darker and terrible times would come. We know that from 2 Timothy 3.1. In the last days, terrible times would come. Look around. Look around. We always knew that God would pour out his wrath on this world and judge all nations. But all of a sudden, it's not fun anymore to talk about it. It's not, it's not fun anymore to theorize about it because it's happening in front of us. This is what we've been expecting. This is what we've been talking about and predicting for all these years. This is what the Bible forecast would happen in the last days. But now, the days, the evil days are upon us, and somehow we're surprised and we don't like it. There is a storm coming to America. And we, we, are, mere, we are mere moments away from the greatest storm America has ever faced has ever suffered. And here's, here's my point of saying all that. I'm not trying to be sensational. I'm trying to be biblical. I'm not trying to fear monger, like I said. Why does God give warnings? Why does God prepare his people? Because he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. 
He is jealous for us. He's saying, prepare my people. And this message, as I said at the top, don't be paralyzed by fear before the storm, but prepare in faith for the storm. This is going to be a message about preparation. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. And oh, I'll get into that in a minute. I, w- I don't want to jump ahead. And, and, th- and I'll be honest with you, this, this message really took on a completely different form over the last week when I was really nailing it down and preparing it. Because two, two weeks ago, I was, I was really preparing something a little different, but the same thing. But I, 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 I began to realize that, you know, I got to lay a groundwork down. So in a lot of ways, this is really a two-part sermon. You'll get to the second part in a month from now. <laughs> You're over at Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Things not yet seen. We've been talking about them for years, but now we're seeing them. But he was divinely warned. Because because historically, throughout the entire Bible, God always warned his people before judgment. God has always warned his people and has always warned even the other nations, even if it wasn't his people, whether whether, whether it was Edom or Moab or Nineveh, those weren't God's people. But God in his faithfulness always sent the prophets to say, repent. God's going to destroy you. God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't want to destroy you. God doesn't want to to bring you to destruction. But you must repent. And if you don't repent, you've sealed your own doom. But he's warned every nation throughout history. That's God's nature. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? Amen. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, he moved with godly fear. What's the next word? Prepared. Prepared. Kataskuazo in the Greek. Kataskuazo means literally to, 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 to prepare, build something. He had to build an ark. You know, you know, you know, a hurricane's coming, board up your windows. You, 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 know, you, know, you know we've been in a drought. Store up on the water. Prepare. In the days of Pharaoh, Pharaoh had a dream. You know the story. And, and, and Joseph interpreted the dream. And in God's mercy, he gave them seven years to prepare for the seven years of leanness. They didn't just shrug it off. A heathen king, Pharaoh, a godless king, Pharaoh, didn't just shrug off the warning from this little Jewish boy, this little Jewish prophet boy. Joseph, what did my, my, what did my dream say? What does it mean? Well, Pharaoh, God's going to wipe out Israel. I mean, I, mean, I mean Egypt. But we got seven years. God's going to give us seven years to prepare. Noah prepared an ark. For what? For the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. As I said, katasuazo, to prepare thoroughly, to prepare. And you know what's interesting about this word? There's, there's another Greek word, hoidomazo. Uh, uh, that means to prepare internally. Because you tell people to prepare, they'll say, well, I'm ready for Jesus to return. You know, all is well with my soul. That's not what katakuazo means. Of course we are to be prepared internally. You ain't saved, you ain't getting raptured. You ain't saved. You ain't born again. No man can enter into the kingdom of heaven unless he's born again. Did not Jesus say that? So in this verse here about being prepared and what I want to get to at some point, there's a storm coming. Of course we ought to be prepared internally. We've got to be right with God. That's already understood. That's what it's saying here. He's saying get ready in the real physical, natural way. Floods are coming. Build a boat. You with me? Yes. America, I'm going to keep saying it over and over, is about to face the fiercest storm it's ever faced, brother. Our way of life is going to be radically transformed. Our way of life is going to be radically transformed. Calamities and destruction 
is coming. I know that's not a popular word. I know it's not. But we've got to hear it. We've got to hear it. Real oppression, real persecution is coming to those in America. We've seen, we've seen the beginning of it. When, 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 when Christian photographers or Christian bakers get fined and sued and prosecuted because they want to live by their convictions. Regarding gay, mar- regarding gay marriage, regarding not, not hey, listen, I'll, I'll bake you cookies and cakes and, and I'll take your pictures for a party, but I can't be involved with your wedding. Those are my convictions. It's called freedom of religion. Our country was based upon it. First Amendment rights being stripped away, being taken away. Christians being marginalized and hated, blame shifting being bigoted. We're suffering. We're seeing what I call soft persecution right now. But given the right amount of events, given the right amount of circumstances, soft persecution will become harder. Will will you and I stand in that day? And as I said a moment ago, when God begins to judge a nation, I'm going to repeat myself for a moment, but he always does it incrementally. I I had a Christian brother vehemently disagree with me, saying God's, he, he believes that America's on the verge of a, a reawakening. He, and praise God if that would have happened. I don't buy into it. Read the prophets. But we had, we had this big disagreement over, over lunch, and I kept saying, America's already being judged. And he was rebuking me. Oh, we're not on the judgment, brother. Where, where do you see judgment? Where, blah, 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 blah. What's God doing? And I went down the list. That's not judgment. You know, God, God didn't kill the firstborn of, of Egypt until the 10th plague. Hello, are you with me? He started out with little things to get their attention. Flies, let my people go. No, here's some flies. Bad, big deal. It's, it's nature. Moses comes back. God says, let my people go. I will not let your people go. Go away, Moses, you're bugging me. <laughs> Frogs. Drought. Oh, it's just the weather. I thought God was in control of everything. Climate change. Yeah, there you go. Climate's been changing ever since the days of Noah, my friend. I keep telling people that all the time. Man has nothing to do with it. Do you understand what I'm saying? God tries to wake us up. A little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, until we harden our hearts and harden our hearts and harden our hearts and harden our hearts until it gets to the point where our firstborn is dead. America's been given warnings for decades now. It was John Calvin. I don't quote John Calvin much. but, But John Calvin said this, when God wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked rulers. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. 20 years ago, 20 years ago, I preached the message at New Covenant. Bill Clinton was in his second term. He was going through the, the Monica Lewinsky debacle. Al Gore was, was now running for president against George Bush. And I preached the message 20 years ago, ago called America at the Crossroads. I went back and I looked up that message because I had everything in my file cabinets to see what I said 20 years ago about America being at the crossroads. And now, 20 years later, we got another Clinton running for president. (sighs) Collective sigh. 20 years later, we got another Clinton running for president, but we got the worst of all possible choices now. Who would have imagined this? We've gone from the crossroads to the conundrum. Hello? We, now, now we get two equally reprehensible and equally dangerous candidates. Now we get two equally corrupt, two equally deceptive candidates. Don't you know, brother, you've got to vote for the lesser of two evils? If I had one, I would. What part of equal don't you understand? Trump or Clinton? From the crossroads to the conundrum. I'm not telling anybody what to do. I'm not. I'm not telling anybody what to do. I'm telling you what I'm doing. 
I'm, I'm, I'm dialing in neither. And a conundrum, a no-win situation. Brother says, I believe that part of the judgment, like John Calvin said, God gives you wicked rulers. Here, God's going to give you what you want. This is what you want? Here you go. Here you go. I preached a message a month ago in another church. Graves of craving. You want, you want, you want, you want, what were those things called? Those birds, I forgot. Quail, thank you. <laughs> you, you want quail, I'll give you quail. That was another message. But, but I believe we're a nation committing national suicide. Forget it. We, we've got enemies foreign and domestic. And then we've got ourselves. You, have, you, know, you, know, you, you know that you know that old saying, I'm my own worst enemy? It's, 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 it, it, we're living it in our nation today because I believe we're committing national suicide. And even though, hear me out, follow me. Don't, I don't want to lose you here. Even though the debate has been framed into this narrative of choosing between the lesser of two evils, really when you get right down to it, the debate, figuratively speaking, is what form of suicide is more palatable to you? The lesser of two evils. Should I hang myself? This is kind of slower, kind of, ugh, I don't know about that. Or should I just drink the hemlock cocktail? What's the lesser of two evils? It's, it's, a, it, 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 it's, it's gotten to be down to a ridiculous argument because that argument, my, my brothers and sisters, that argument really, it, 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 that debate, it really is, is a deflection at this point. It's really a, a, a diversion at this point. Column is Cal Thomas. You know who Cal Thomas is? He, he, he made the statement a couple of months back. It was a great statement. He said, this election is not, the, this election is not about the lesser of two evils. It's about the, the evil of two lessers. Good, right? That'll stick with you. You see, here's my point in all of that. We become a nation just like the Ninevites who can't discern their left hand from their right hand. When you can't discern between good and evil anymore, or if you're willing for the sake of expediency of suspending your principles for the quote-unquote lesser of two evils, then you simply become ripe for the propaganda because you want to believe the propaganda. You want to believe what they're telling you. You want it to, you, you, you want it to be true. You, you're hoping to be true because you're grasping onto some straw of hope to justify you breaking your own principles. I say we need to stand up as a people of God and walk in our integrity, personally. You see, because evil today is in the eye of the beholder, is it not? We're a nation that, 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 as I said, we can't discern our left hand from our right hand. We're a nation that calls evil good and good evil. We're a nation that thinks boys can be girls and girls can be boys, or neither. We're a nation that can no longer figure out which bathroom it should use. We're a nation that denies that biology is reality. We're a nation that thinks that denying one's DNA is A-OK. -okay. A nation that says it's going to choose the lesser of two evils can't even discern what evil is. Are you following me? Look at the insanity of what just recently happened with that horrific the Orlando shooting, the terrorism in Orlando. Look at, the, look at the insanity of what our government officials were trying to do. And what I call the intellectually vacuous left. Someone told me, a month or two ago, that it was wrong for me, even though, even, though they're, even though they're biblical terms, he told me it was wrong for me as a Christian to call people stupid or morons. But that's actually, those are actually biblical terms. Read Proverbs. It talks a lot about stupid people and morons. <laughs> so I, I said, okay, brother, I, I don't want to be offensive. I'll use the politically correct term, intellectually vacuous. That's, that's, that's par for the course for the times, is it not? So, those who are intellectually vacuous, they try blaming everything else for that attack on Orlando. 
except what it really was. You know, see, 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 you know, let's blame it on, of course, of course, the hatred of Islam and the hatred of apocalyptic Islam and, and jihadists, it's, it's the Christian right's fault. You heard that, did you not? It's all over the papers. The, the intellectually vacuous left, blaming everything and anything. Blame the NRA, blame conservatives, blame Christians, blame Chick-fil-A. No, no, no. See, they don't want to blame apocalyptic Islam for its own hatred, for its own evil, for its own theology. No, 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 because we, they're all just peaceful Muslims. It's not jihadism. It's not about Islam or Muslims. Think about this. Think about this. The intellectually vacuous left tell us that if a woman wants to call themselves a man, they could be a man. The intellectually vacuous left tells us that if a man wants to call himself a woman and use the woman's bathroom, you got to believe them. They're allowed to self-identify. But when a Muslim terrorist stands up and says, I did it for Allah, and when a Muslim terrorist stands up and says, I pledge my allegiance to, to, to ISIS, these same people tell us, no, 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 no. They're, they're not a Muslim. Blessed consistency. Hello? You, you, you with me? The hypocrisy, the duplicity is, is amazing to watch with these people. Like I said, these, same, these very same people that, that tell us People are allowed to self-identify, can't call evil what it is. Newsflash. The enemy of the West and the enemy of America is apocalyptic Islam. And I wish I had the time today to get into that, but I don't. I'll save that for another message. But it is Islamic theology. It is. ISIS, all these people that come off and say ISIS has nothing to do with Muslims, they're intellectually vacuous. I've spent the last three years doing something I wish I would never have had to do because in the past it would have been a waste of time. But I've spent the last three years studying Islamic theology and studying Islamic eschatology because, because you got to prepare and you got to know what you're up against. And the vacuous, intellectually vacuous left don't want to, want to see those things. They, they want to ignore those things. And because they ignore those things and refuse to accept those things, they'll call good evil and evil good. We are in those days. Stuff is coming. That's all I can say. Stuff is coming. And the stuff is about to hit the fan in America on so many different levels. And I'm going to mix metaphors a little bit. I've been talking about a storm. But I'm going to mix metaphors a little bit because, hey, listen, Paul used to do it all the time. Read, read the New Testament. Paul mixed metaphors all the time. But the storm, my friends, is the sword. The storm is the sword. And there are, and this is really what I was preparing several weeks ago. Like I said, the Lord gave me a little bit of a left turn a little bit. But I'm going to tell you the, the, the swords that are coming against America. To, some of them are already here. I can't delineate on them today. I don't have the time. But I want you to write them down and just think about it. Go into the Word because you'll, you'll, you'll see that this is what's happening already. But there are three specific swords that are coming against America. And it's all for a testing, and I'll get into that in a second. But I'm going to give you these swords, because maybe, maybe a month from now I might preach on these three things. But the sword of division, the sword of division is coming against America. And I think it's pretty plain to see it's already begun. This country's never been more divided. The church has never been more divided. Christians have never been more divided. But I want to tell you something. It's the sword of the Lord. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And from this time forward, mother shall be against daughter and daughter against mother. Remember that scripture? We don't talk about that scripture too much. But there is a sword of the vision that's coming against America. There's a sword of deception 
The deception will permeate the atmosphere. It'll come from the news media. It'll come from the propaganda and the entertain the propaganda of the news media and the entertainment industry. The indoctrination. You can't even go and see a kid's Walt Disney movie now. They want to make lesbian lovers. They want to get what's that movie, Marsha? Uh, Frozen. Else, what's her name? They, they, they want to give Elsa a lesbian lover. A kid's movie. Uh, we went to go see a, a movie not too long ago with our five-year-old granddaughter. And I was, you know, and they're like looking at the cartoon, a lot of that's cute. And all I could see was the propaganda. Marsha kept telling me to shut up. <laughs> what? I don't even know if that movie was Disney. That, what, that was that zoology? Was that Disney? Zootopia. The, the indoctrination in that movie, the propaganda in that kid's movie, it was like I was having a meltdown watching this stupid kid's cartoon. Of course the kids don't understand it. That's how our propaganda works. You just keep indoctrinating, and you just keep indoctrinating, and you just keep indoctrinating, so that when they go home, and everything you try to teach your kids about what's right and wrong, they'll say, no, it's not. It's okay to do that. Everybody's doing it, Mom. The sword of division is coming against this country. The sword of deception is coming against this country. And the sword of destruction. There are calamities coming. There are devastations coming that will cause men's hearts to fear and melt in despondency. And I want you to, I want you to understand something. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not relishing in this. I'm not wishing for this. I'm not happy about any of this, except that Jesus is going to come back. Hello? But there's a lot of false prophets in the land. Some of them have big names. I don't care how big your ministry is. I really don't. I'm so far past even thinking like that. I want the truth of the word of God. Not our fluff, not our Americanized version of the gospel, not our, not our Americanized, our, our American-centric gospel. And there are false prophets in the land, I won't name them, I could, who are preaching God's peace and God's blessing and God's awakening uh, on this country, just like it was in the days of Jeremiah. There was one prophet saying, uh-uh, 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 that's not what God's saying. But every other prophet was saying, Jeremiah, you're an idiot. Smacking him, throwing him in the pit. Turn me to Ezekiel 21. I'm going to go through this really quickly, a little bit. And like I said, Lord willing, unless he really gives me something completely different, maybe I'll pick up on this again in a few weeks. But I want to show you some things in Ezekiel 21. And I'm going to, I'm going to go through this really quick. A little bit here. You know, a lot of, lot, before I read that, Here's, here's one of the problems you have in the churches today. Here's one of the problems you have in, in, with, with many Christians today. When I, when I start sharing these, these, these kind of scriptures with people, one of the first things they say to me is, that's Old Testament, brother. And then I say, yeah, Romans 15, 4 says the things that were written before were written for our learning and for our understanding that we might have hope. 1 Corinthians, says, Paul says the same thing. Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, all scripture, all scripture, all scripture is, is, is profitable for learning, for teaching. God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His, he hasn't changed. His character hasn't changed. He hasn't become some senile old man. But we think he has because we've changed. The times have changed. We've changed. The church has changed. But God hasn't changed. His pre- the, word, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. Jesus said, not one jot, one tittle shall be, shall, be, shall be thrown to the side until all has been fulfilled. The principles of God are from everlasting to everlasting. Ezekiel 21, and the Lord, verse 1. I'm going to read this through as quick as I can because I'm running out of time. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Jerusalem. Preach against the holy places. Prophesy against the land of Israel. That was God's people. Prophesy against my people. God doesn't beat up his people. That's what I hear from Christians. It's not about beating up his people. It's about his people who left him and he needs to bring them back. 
You know, if you're a parent, you understand. Hello? But God says, I will draw out my sword. In verse, what is it? Verse two or three here. I will draw out my sword out of its sheath and cut off, cut off both righteous and wicked from you. What about the ten righteous in the land? Different story, different application. God's going to judge a nation. I'm going to skip down to verse 8. I want to read, I'm going to read this through context because I, I want to I show you something here. Verse 8, again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy, and say, Thus says the Lord, say, A sword, a sword is sharpened and also polished, sharpened to make a dreadful slaughter, polished, polished to flash like lightning. Should we then make mirth? Some will say yes. Ignore that crazy gloom and doom stuff. It's time to just, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. Good times are here. Verse 11, he has given it to be polished, speaking of the sword, that it may be handled. The sword is sharpened, and it is polished to, to be given into the hand of the slayer. Cry and wail, son of man, for it shall be against my people, against all the princes of Israel. Terrors! Terrors! including the sword, will be against my people. Verse 13. Because it is a testing. See that? America, and perhaps more specifically, the American church is going and is being put to the test. The test has already begun, my friends. The test is quite simple. Who will we serve? Who will we put our faith and trust in? What will we serve? Will we serve our own parochial interests, our own self-interest? Will we serve the Lord come what may? Well, God, if you don't give me what I, what I want, I'm not going to serve you anymore. God, if you don't protect me from the sword, I'm not going to serve you anymore. The sword's coming against the righteous and the wicked for different reasons. For different reasons. You got to trust, you got to trust, you got to trust the Lord. I'm not saying it's going to be pleasant. But the sword will come to destroy the wicked and sharpen the believer. Peter said, do, 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 not, do not fret, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, because of the testing of your faith. The sword's going to come to destroy the wickedness and to judge the evil, but to test the sincerity of our faith. Are we who we say we are? It's easy to be, full of, to be full of courage and boldness in a church on a Sunday morning. Not so much so if you see black flags coming down your road. I see black I won't, I probably shouldn't say that. I was going to say something, I better not say it. I'm running out of time. And I told Marsha to give me a, because I, 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 I don't want to weigh you out. This is the day of preparation. She, she, I'm, 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 I told her to clock me. I did, I told her to clock me. Because I do. I, I have two or three messages here. I want to give you some practical stuff. I want to tell you. I want to give you the warning. The storm is coming. The storm is coming. The sword is coming. It's already started. And I want to give you a list of some practical things. Because Noah prepared in the practical. He got his boat ready. He stored up the food. You got to feed a lot of animals, man. There are practical things. Christians don't want to do practical things. I was talking to a brother a, a few months back. He's like, well, I ain't afraid of any of that. God does not give me a spirit of fear. I said, it's not about a spirit of fear. It's about getting ready. Getting ready in the practical stuff. Will the rapture's come? And yeah, but do you know when? Because I don't. Hello? I believe in the rapture. But my Bible tells me through many tribulations must you enter the kingdom of heaven. When you read in the book of Revelation, the seven churches, Jesus is in charge of the churches, is he not? That means Jesus is in charge of you, and Jesus is in charge of me. And what Jesus does with you, he might not do with me. Go read those seven letters of the churches. Because in one church, he says, he says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you. And you'll have tribulation for ten days. To another church, he says, Behold, I'm going to keep you from the hour of testing. Well, that's not fair. I'm going to go to that church. 
Oh, Lord, I'm leaving, man. I'm going to that church. Be prepared for what the Lord has for you. Be prepared for what the Lord has for you. That day when Jesus re, re uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Reassigned, if you will, Peter on the beach that day. And Peter looked up and said, Lord, what about him pointing to John? Because there's a rumor going around, John wasn't going to suffer persecution. There was a rumor going around, like in the church in Smyrna, God, God's going to keep him from, from, being, from being persecuted. He's not going to die. And that got into the ear of Peter. Well, what about him? What's that to you, Peter? What's that to you, what I do with him? You follow me. So don't think that you don't have to prepare because the rapture's coming. That's been a, that's been a heresy throughout church history. Paul even said about it. People, people aren't preparing themselves spiritually and materially because, because they think they're going to they're gonna escape all this stuff. It doesn't work that way. That's not how any of this works. I'm going to give you a list of things. And they're real practical. You say, well, that's really dumb. I wasn't thinking like this 10 years ago. Prepare financially. And that's hard because who's got money? Prepare financially. If the banks crash and you can't get your money out because they've locked them down, they've done that in Greece. They've done it in Crete. Keep cash, emergency cash on hand. Put it in your pillowcase. Put it under your mattress the old-fashioned way. I'm serious. It's practical. I've got, I've got half my savings, in, and it's not a lot, trust me. It's easy for me. I've just done, just done a lot there. But we've got some in the bank because it's kind of safe there and it's until, until all havoc breaks loose. But we've been stashing cash away at home in a, in a, in a safe emergency cash. Because if, 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 if the power grid goes down, you can't get it out of an ATM. If the banks crash and they decide for you to have a, not a bailout, but a bail-in, because that's what, the, that's what the financial people are calling it now. If there's, a, if there's another financial meltdown, this is what they did in Crete. People who had money in the banks and the government failed, the government just came and took their money. By the way, it's called stealing. It's called theft, unless the government does it. Then it's just called bailing. Oh, that can't happen here. I'm not trusting that rhetoric. <laughs> because if stuff really happens really bad, and I, I, I do believe it's going to, you're going to need cash. I, I think that's pretty like just common sense thing. Have, have whatever you can. Everyone has different things. Whatever you can have at home, stash it. Put it in a safe place for that rainy day. Be prepared. Stock up on your food supplies. Stock up on your, you know, put, put, a, put, a, put a food pantry in your, in your basement. Put a food pantry in your, in, your, in, your, in, in, in your garage or whatever. Extra food. Again, it's not, it's, this isn't relevatory. But do you know, what, and, and they've been predicting this. I, this is one thing that I hate all the time. It's like, why do they show this stuff on TV and tell our enemies what? They, well, they, the answer is, is that the enemies already know this. If they took the power grid down, and trust me, it's already been attempted. They've already tested. ISIS has already tested ways to take down our power grid. If they take the power grid down, life changes forever. There, there, are, there are estimates that, that say in the first year, 150, 200 million Americans would die within the year. The power grid comes down we are thrown back into the dark ages. Last year, for the first time in history, and no one, no one knew why, except I scratched my head and said, I bet you that's why. Iran, last year, you know when they were making that great deal with they can't build nuclear weapons that they actually probably already have, but if they don't have them, they're just days away from them. But they sent a ship last year from Iran to 200 miles off the eastern seaboard of, our, of America. Did you know that? Did you read about that in the newspaper? We were watching it. There was an Iranian warship 200 miles off the coast of America. And everyone was saying, why would they do that? They don't have a navy. They don't need a navy. All they need is one missile. All they need to do is shoot one missile 
off the eastern seaboard and detonated 100 miles in, in the atmosphere over the central United States. That EMP pulse will wipe out the grid. North Korea. North Korea has been testing missiles. Every one of their missile tests, the missiles blow up at a certain altitude. And the West is saying, those stupid North Koreans, they can't, they, they can't, they can't fire a missile. Their missiles aren't working. They're detonating them at the height that they want to detonate them at for the most effective EMP pulse. Again, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not. It's reality. And everybody's walking around with their fingers in the ears singing la da 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 da. La da 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 da. I don't want to hear it. So, do you have a generator? Do you have a generator? Just a practical. I bought a generator last year. I went out and I bought a, I, I, I bought, I bought a propane and a gas generator. If you don't have a generator, put, get, 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 have, have emergency cash, have extra food, get a generator. It's just practical stuff to prepare for the storm. If you never need it, praise God. But if you need, if you need it, you don't have it. Exactly. Exactly. You don't want to use it. But better to have it if you need it. And I probably, I, I, I'm going to nail this one down. Everyone's going to struggle with this. We could talk about it all the time. But I, you got to decide what is good for you and your family. And I, I, and I say that sincerely. I say that so sincerely. Because I struggled with this for years. Until God told me and released me and gave me a rhema word. But yes, I did. I went out and I bought firearms for myself. I was always anti. I was always anti-gun until a few years ago, because that's what I saw. That's what I felt. That's what that was my conviction. And I prayed for two years when I started feeling like maybe we should get maybe we should get something to protect ourselves. We got these crazy drug cartels in Riverhead. We've got ISIS. You know, right now we got lone wolves. What happens when the lone wolf becomes a pack of wolves? I got news for you. I see black flags coming down coming down my my street. And they're shooting up the neighborhood. I'll do what I have to do to protect my friends, my neighbors, and my family. There's nothing wrong with that. Some Christians struggle with that. I don't. There was a time when Jesus said to his disciples, he said, you know when I told you to go out the first time? I told you don't bring a money sack, don't bring a backpack, don't bring anything. And, he, and Jesus said, did you lack anything? They said, no. Now I tell you, go. Bring a backpack, bring sandals. And if you don't have a sword, go and buy one. That's how the Lord gave me a rhema word because I never read it that way before. But this is what hit me. The next verse said, Peter says, here, Lord, we've got two of them. The light bulbs went off in my head. The disciples were walking around with swords. They don't show that in all those Jesus movies. <laughs> they just showed, all the disciples were just like, you know, peace, 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 and hippie kind of people, you know. Love, love, and peace. They had swords with them, brother. And Jesus said, that's enough. And I'm serious. That's not for everybody. You've got to pray about that. But hear my heart on this. There's nothing wrong with defending yourself against evil. There's a time to be a martyr. There's a time to be a martyr. You capture me and you say, deny Jesus or I'm taking your head off. Thank you, Jesus. I'm coming home. But you're going to have to catch me first. <laughs> it's not about fearing what's coming. It's about preparing for what's coming. Stand up together, please. And I know Marsha keeps showing me the clock and I went longer than I wanted to, but I got so much here I want to share with you. We're living in, in, in incredible times, but we got to be prepared. And it's not about being scared. It's about being prepared. Close your eyes, please. I'm going to just read to you Everything I'm going to read to you right now are the words of Jesus Christ, the lover of your soul. Close your eyes. Shut yourself in him right now. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. 
Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. These things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Do not fear, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Brother Tom.